Is it possible to beat Republicans in deeply red states like Utah? Maybe with a former Republican. Uh, we've got one on who came in third in the presidential race in 2016 in Utah, but he did get 21% of the vote and he's running for Senate now. Evan McMullen joins us. Uh, Evan, welcome. Great to be with you, Jenk. No problem. So there's a lot I wanna talk about the Republican Party. Um, and um, let's start with, I wanna say why did you leave the party? Although that's kind of blaringly obvious. Um, but uh, why did you even want to be a Republican? <laughs> so let's start that way. <laughs> because for example, Evan, well, I, I was a Republican back in the 80s and 90s and, and back when it, it appeared they had not lost their mind. But by the time you were making the switch, they had, in my opinion, fully lost their mind a while back. So uh, I don't know whether to ask you, why did you leave or what took you so long? Well, I mean, look, I, I was raised in a Republican family like many people. My parents were at the time moderate Republicans. They were inclusive people who, I mean, we weren't an overly political family. I mean, I, I did get involved in politics as a young man, but my parents weren't super political, but they were moderate Republicans and, and I was raised in in such a household. And so it's what I knew. I'm also a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. And that's a culture that for the last couple of decades or more has been mostly Republican. And so it's just what I, I came from. Uh, but then I ended up working in national security as a CIA officer and came back to the United States after I completed my service. And uh, long story short, was asked to be asked to come back and be a national security advisor in Congress by the Republicans, by a, a moderate Republican named uh, uh, Ed Royce, who was the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So I went and did that. I thought it was a good opportunity to serve. It was very cross partisan. We worked with Democrats and Republicans there. And then I was asked to come be the chief policy director of the House Republicans in Congress. And I thought, well, great, this will be a tremendous opportunity. And, and my vision for the, for the Republican Party was very Lincolnian. I believed uh, I, I had his same vision still for the party. And I wanted to take the party in that direction. And so I worked hard to do that. Obviously, I failed. Trump rise, arose through the primaries and I opposed him and advised Republicans to stay away. Obviously, I lost that debate. And, uh, and then in August of, of 2016, left my position, resigned there and, and have been fighting for American democracy ever since. So that's, that's been my path. So you're running against Mike Lee in Utah. So he's pretty well entrenched. Uh, he's uh, fairly well known as one of the more libertarian, right wing senators in the country. But it gets complicated, Evan, because there's different branches of the Republican Party. So he's more right wing in some instances, but then he'll go all the way around and sometimes uh, agree with progressives on anti-war positions, etc. And the corporatist swing of the Republican Party will be more pro-war. How many wings are there of the Republican Party now and do you support any of them? Well, I would say that it's very complicated, right? We have a two party system and because of that, both of our major parties are complicated coalitions that you could cut in so many pieces. But in terms of this election, I, I have a more and need to need to have a more simplistic view of it. And that is simply that there are Republicans at this point who are opposed to American democracy. And there are other Republicans who are not. I am building a coalition in Utah and, and frankly, we've built it. We're mobilizing it now in this election that includes Republicans who are committed to the rule of law. They're committed to truth. They're committed to our founding ideals. They, they want to stand up to Putin. They, they don't support the insurrectionists. They're institutionalists and Democrats and independents. That is the coalition that supports me and that wants to replace Mike Lee. And I'm focused on that. 
Um, so it, it does get more complicated than that, obviously. But my view is that if you're for our founding ideal still, you're for truth, you're for democracy, you're opposed to the insurrection on January 6th and, and other efforts to undermine our democratic republic, then then I, I want you to be with me. And that we are a majority of the state and a majority of the state wants to replace Mike Lee because of these issues, we're united on these things. Now, as far as Mike Lee is concerned, he calls himself a constitutional conservative, but he advised Trump's efforts to overturn the last election. You cannot call yourself a constitutional conservative if you're trying to overturn the institutions that are essential for protecting liberty and justice for all in America. And that is exactly what he has done. He is not a constitutional conservative, he's a, he's a performative uh, faux conservative. And it's harming the interests of Utah and our country, and and that's why I'm opposing him and and uh, building this coalition to replace him. So, Evan, normally I'd be very skeptical uh, that there is a sane wing of the Republican Party left, but you did run against Trump literally uh, and got 21% of the vote. And I don't think a lot of Hillary Clinton uh, voters voted for you. Uh, I think that uh, it probably were Republicans and a really decent chunk of them in Utah. That, that voted for you back in 2016. Um, so tell me about this mythical sane wing of the Republican Party. So the ones that don't hate democracy, don't hate all minorities. It's so hard to believe it's real. Um, so what, what gives you, other than all the way back in 2016, what gives you, uh, you know, the opinion, the belief that they exist? Well, we've we've done a lot of polling on it, frankly. I mean, it, it cert, certainly, you know, this is where I live. These are my neighbors, my friends. You know, I understand what's happening here. But a third of the Republican Party, you know, I can quantify it. About a third of the Republican Party is opposed to its current direction nationally. Now, we have some good Republican leaders here. Our, our governor. Uh, Spencer Cox is a center right Republican, uh, has opposed the extremes in the party. And we've got obviously Senator Romney here and others. And so, uh, but but a third of the party is opposed to the, the national party's current direction and opposed to Trump and, uh, and very much interested in replacing Mike Lee. So we just know that's the case. You know, if the question is about Trump as a proxy for the far right and whether someone is anti or pro democracy, uh, he won the state in the last last election in 2020 with 58% of the vote. And now he's polling at about 45%. And that shift happened after January 6th. And it's held pretty constant, pretty stable. And so what what I, th- I think a lot of people don't understand about Republicans here in Utah, but it's important is that they many of them may have voted for Trump, but they never loved Trump. They never really supported him or liked him. They did vote for him. There's there's a you know a strong partisanship here in Utah that prevents many people from being crossover voters in that direction. So they held their noses and they voted for him. It doesn't mean they support him certainly on an ongoing basis. And it doesn't mean they'd like, you know, they'd prefer, it doesn't mean they wouldn't like to see something better. And so, you know, that's what we know here. And the proof is in the data and and in the last election results and in Donald Trump's polling. And of course, what we did in 2016. So, you know, if you're talking about nationally, I would say no. I've seen the polling, and uh, there was a famous poll called the 2020 election, and that's where Trump got 93% of the Republican vote. So they saw what a monster he was, how awful he was in every way, and they're like, mm, love it. And they showed up in record numbers to vote for him. But Utah is a little bit of a special case. And again, you got a big chunk of the vote in 2016, which was unusual. Uh, and And I believe you that your polling indicates that a third of Republicans in Utah are relatively sane and don't hate democracy or America. Uh, So congratulations, Utah. Uh, So why, why is Utah different than the rest of the, because it's very right wing, but yet it has some sane Republicans. What's the difference between Utah and the rest of the country? Look, there's there's a reason, you know, and and it is in our history. It's in our DNA. You know, my ancestors first came to Utah in the mid 1800s. They did so because they had joined the Mormon Church 
and they were persecuted as a result of it. They had fought in the Revolutionary War. They had settled on an, in an, on an island in Maine and they became shipbuilders. And then they joined this new church called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they were persecuted for it and they were run out of there and elsewhere where they tried to settle on the mainland in the United States by government backed mobs. And eventually they trekked across the plains and the Rockies and found a safe haven in Utah. And when they arrived here, you know they were uh, you know they were not the first obviously to to pass through this area. Obviously, Native Americans had been living here, but but there had been other Europeans and Americans who had come through. It, traders, trappers, gold rush people, all of these people had come through and decided that Utah was too harsh of an environment uh, to to settle in. So they moved on. Uh, but when my ancestors came to Utah and when other pioneers came to Utah. They, they wanted the isolation because they were looking for safety. They were looking for opportunity. And so they had to make this harsh environment work for them. And they could only do it by working together. And I, that may sound trite to some people, but it's the honest to goodness truth. They had to work together in order to survive and thrive here. And they did, and that's still part of our culture here. And so you know we're very sensitive to, to, uh, to I would say uh, demagoguery and despotism to scapegoating people because we've been the subject of that. And so we're very sensitive to it, but also we have a political culture here. While not complete, we've got, you know, there are exceptions to this certainly, but we do have a, a portion of our political por- culture is driven by community and driven by yes, sticking to principle, but still finding gr- common ground to solve problems. And that's what we call proudly the Utah way. And we're not perfect in it, but it is informed by our history, I believe. I believe that's, you know, this reality for us politically is, is rooted in our history. So good news, I just figured out Utah completely. So I'm gonna take your answer and then I'm gonna say it in my words, which are gonna be very different. And then you're gonna tell me whether I'm right or wrong, okay? So I know that Utah is also has a history with Mormons going to Mexico because of some of the laws that were passed and then having to immigrate back here. And so they are a little bit more open to immigrants than the rest of the Republican Party. So that's an interesting history. But as you explained it, Evan, it became clear to me that the reason that they're Republicans is because conservatives generally circle the wagons and they protect their own and they're worried about people outside the wagons, which could fairly describe the Mormon community. They had to circle the wagons a lot, which might lead to a conservative mindset. But on the other hand, they were always the others. And so when you do demagoguery against the others, which is what Trump's specialty, uh, it isn't the culture of the Mormons to be turned off by that because they were the others. Um, That's right. Does that make sense to you as to the, the special brand of Republicans we have in Utah because of that culture? Yeah, I, I, I think I think it's a big part of it. Certainly, I really do. I mean, it's it's our experience. I mean, we're told stories even from a young age about our ancestors who suffered this way and that way, and. You know, it, it's it's a it's a part of our culture, and it from from a very early age, and it it, it informs our politics, I believe. Yeah, uh, Mormons, the discriminated uh, against white people. Uh, okay, <laughs> but by the way, historically, definitely true. Your words, not mine. Your words, <laughs> not mine. This is certainly true. Okay, uh, let me ask you: something. Is there any hope for the Republican Party left? I mean, given that ninety three percent voted for Trump. Uh, about two thirds of Republicans in the country now still say the election was stolen and Trump had won and Biden's a liar and he's not really the president. That is pretty damning numbers. That's obviously not attached to reality. Uh, Trump lost over 60 court cases, never presented any evidence. In fact, today, Marjorie Taylor Greene said, "Oh, I know the election was stolen." When asked how, she said, "Oh, I have no idea how." Then how would you know it was stolen, <laughs> right? So, but that is two thirds of Republicans in the whole country. So is there any hope left for that party? Yeah, look, if we had a, a multi-party system like you find in, in most countries in the in, in Europe, I would say probably not. I would say it would probably be replaced by another conservative party that was committed to our foundational values and to democracy and, and healthy governance. But, uh, but we have a, a, an entrenched two-party system in this country that gives either party uh, a, a, a special chance to recover, even if it 
really drifts off into a bad place. And so uh, and so I think that there is still hope for the Republican Party. I, I'll say that you know my main concern is I just like to see two healthy parties committed to our fundamental values that we're all created free and equal and therefore we have an, a, a government that that belongs to us that that is accountable to us and a country in which everybody who calls this place home has an opportunity to pursue happiness. That's I want to see parties committed to that. That's what I want to see. As far as the Republican Party is concerned, I think it's possible that if it if it if it fails to win elections for long enough, that it could out of self interest alone reform. The problem is that if it believes that it's losing elections because those elections have been stolen from them, then they'll just give up on democracy rather than making reforms that they need to be healthy and competitive. And so it is possible even in this entrenched two party system that the Republican Party will will not take advantage of the unusual opportunity it has to still reform even as it becomes very unhealthy and even dangerous. Um, it, it is possible that it, it could not save itself because too many of, uh, you know, because the far right has become too influential within the party and the far right is not uh, moored in truth, nor does it care to be. So I, I don't know, but I do think that the Republican Party will likely continue in its current direction for quite some time, for years. Uh, and um, and and again, though there are Republicans who uh, are not on board with with a, a direction led by insurrectionists, and uh, and and they are an important electorate for protecting our democratic republic, and and you know they are uh, people who stand with independents and Democrats who want uh, more unifying, effective, pro democracy governance. Okay, Evan, that leads to at least important. at least here in Utah. Uh, that leads to an important question. So this myth- mythical one third of Republicans, a little bit across the nation, because one third do say, "Oh, well, maybe Biden did win. Uh, maybe not everyone on the planet is lying, right?" Including Republican state office holders who swear up and down a thousand times over that Biden won. Uh, so and and more so in Utah. Um, but what are they Republican about, right? So you're not a Democrat, so you you you're still holding on to that version of conservatism. What is that version? Because the rest of the, the Republicans are obvious. They say we hate the others. We're owning the libs is their number one priority, and libs minorities are fairly similar in their minds, and so they're driven by fear and hatred, and no. Every piece of data indicates that, so I'm not having that conversation. I'm having the conversation about what's the other third? Yeah, look, I would just say that that it's important to understand that that every Republican who feels poorly represented by the Republican right now is having a bit of a, a, a political an identity crisis may be the right term for some, but they certainly feel politically homeless. And, and I think about that as, as a journey, it's a path. And different Republicans or former Republicans or conservative or Republican leaning independents, they're all in different places along that path. And so it's, um, you know, it's hard to characterize them all with one fell swoop. It's just very difficult to do. But it, it's an important to know for people that, that disaffected Republicans or principled Republicans, whatever you want to call them, they're all struggling as they feel poorly represented by their own party. They don't know what to do. They're not Democrats for a variety of reasons. We can talk about that, but or not yet Democrats. Some are Democrats, some have become Democrats. But it's they're all traveling on this path, unsure about many of them what the next step is. It's a difficult position to be in if you've associated with the party your entire life and all of a sudden it's not what you thought it was or it abandons you, then what do you do? It's tough. But I would say this, that you're asking about my own conservatism. And I think I can speak for, for some people in this, in this category. And that is for me, conservatism have, has always meant first and foremost, that we wanted to preserve our commitment to our founding values. And, and Abraham Lincoln talked about that when he talked to slave owners that, you know, if, if they called themselves conservatives, but if they weren't trying to conserve our commitment to our founding values, 
then what kind of conservatives were they? Well, I would ask the same question to the far right these days. But that is always, I mean, I'm deeply passionate about about those, I believe not. they're not only values or ideals or principles of this country, but I believe they're truths. That we are created free, that it's part of our human nature, our minds are free. And I believe that we are equal in value. And this comes from my faith experience, my faith tradition, which tells me, teaches me that that you know there is a God who loves us all equally. And to me, that means we're all of equal value and that's a case closed. But I also understand that freedom requires that government be accountable to all people equally. And so we're all equal under the law. And if that's not the case, then our freedom or the realization of that freedom is arbitrary and therefore we're not free at all. So those values, I'm deeply passionate about those values more than anything else. I seek to conserve American commitment to those values. And for me, that is always, that has always been what conservatism means at its, or should mean at its deepest roots. Mm, I don't know, it's largely sound like a Democrat. Um, okay, but it should it should just be something that an American would say. And let, let me say one more thing about this. You know, I, I think uh, often you know the the difference between progressives and conservatives is is psychological too. I mean, I'll admit. I mean, for example, my wife and I we love to hike and we go on these big adventures in the mountains and we like to you know we're peak baggers. We like to climb as many peaks as we can. I'm always the one that says, okay, babe. We shouldn't do that. Let's not take that route. That's not a good idea. Or we're running out of daylight. We ought to head back now. Or whatever it is, I'm the cautious one always, and she's she's less cautious. And uh, and she's also uh, to a little bit to my left, frankly. And so it's um, you know I think there's a a mentality there that that comes from uh, you know there, our politics. I think are driven. Uh, by our our psychology at times, and I'll admit to being a, a cautious person in general. And yes, I can take calculated risks. I certainly have done that in you know as I served in the Central Intelligence Agency. But but in general, I'm I am a, a cautious actor, and so that's just my approach to politics as well. I seek to preserve before I want to make big changes because I'm worried about losing what we already have. Okay, that's fair, and that is conservative. Um, uh, whereas we're for a more aggressive positive change. Um, so now you mentioned that you were a former CIA officer. We, at TYT Investigates, um, we actually talked to a CIA veteran, Steve Hall, and he said something interesting to us. He said that Russia uh, had been specifically looking to build ties with the Christian far right here. And that's part of the reason they infiltrated the National Prayer Breakfast and set up relationships. Um, with people like Senator Mike Lee, etc. And uh, one of the reasons was that they had a shared bond, uh, which was anti LGBTQ um, ideology. In fact, I want to show you a clip, funny enough, from just the last two days of Steve Bannon and Eric Prince that makes that point perfectly. I mean, it's a story we broke a while back. And then look at it in real life here. Watch. Putin ain't woke. He is anti woke. The Russians, people still know which bathroom to use. They know how many how many genders are there in Russia? Two. They don't have boys swimming in girls uh, college swim meets. How backward. It's, it's how, how embarrassing, how savage. So uh, is that part of the reason why these what I would consider weirdo right wing, uh, but in their case, Christian right wing uh, contingents seem to be openly rooting for Russia. Well, Steve Hall is correct in in uh, reporting that the Russians started investing in uh, building ties with the far right and the far religious right about a decade ago, a little over a decade ago, especially. And they were able, and Putin was able to capitalize on the idea that some Christians have that um, that, uh, that 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 those who look and believe like me are at risk. And you know, there's there is a feeling among some in the cultural religious right that. And the reason why I say it that way is because if you're a true Christian and you care at all about 
actual Christianity and and following uh, Christ. Uh, certainly, you can you can look at Putin and say uh, he is the polar opposite of that. Um, but there are some who I think call themselves Christians who uh, have little concern for what that actually means. What they mean by it is preserving a culture and a country that benefits people who look and believe like me religiously rather than uh, rather than a country that is uh, a home to uh, all kinds of people, people who have different colors of skin and different beliefs and sexual orientations and you know all of that. Uh, and and frankly, America should not be defined by the color of our skin or our religious beliefs or where we're where we were even born. Um, the blood, you know, uh, on the right, on the far right, they talk about America being defined by its by blood and soil, which is another way of saying by white people who were born in America, and that's what that's who America should be for. And so, anyway, Vladimir Putin saw that that there was a that there were changing demographics in in the United States of America, and there was a growing uh, white grievance on the the far right that could be exploited, and that he could be the champion of those people in. Europe and in his country in Russia and in the United States. And so he invested there and nobody was very nobody was paying very close attention to it beyond people like Steve Hall. Um, but now we're, we're seeing the results of it and Putin is attacking his neighbor and a, a democracy an independent democracy. And we have members of the far right Steve Bannon and others cheering him on or justifying him or carrying his talking points. Tucker Carlson is another one and it's a real problem and it's it's a it's a real threat and I think and I'm sorry I'm going on so long about this but I what it what it says to me is that those of us who are still committed to our foundational ideals to truth and to American democracy, we have to unite. Yes, we have many policy differences, although I think there's far more common ground at this point than the vast majority of people recognize on even the most, even the toughest issues. But we have to unite because we have an anti democracy movement in this country that is growing and it has international allies. And as we are divided in, in those of us who, who uh, support American democracy, as we're divided, we as you know, we provide them a path to power and a path to undermine American democracy. And so we've got to unite and that's what we're doing here in Utah. We're building this coalition and we're off to a very strong start in doing it. Um, but it's something that should happen on the national level too. Building coalitions of principled or disaffected Republicans, Democrats and independents. Yep, Evan, one last question for you. Uh, Mike Lee again is your opponent in this Senate race, and uh, and we also broke a story on TYT Investigates about how he has been um, working with Guatemala's ambassador, who's uh, invited to, uh, by the family again, this group that runs an actual prayer breakfast, uh, and then he even has a picture that we have uh, with the Guatemalan president Jimmy Morales. So now that's normal uh, until you find out what he did for Jimmy Morales. Without disclosing any of this, uh, he helped to gin up false accusations against a UN task force trying to prosecute Morales for campaign finance crimes. So helping to cover up corruption. Now corruption is out of control in Guatemala, which by the way is driving a lot of people out of the country and uh, into becoming immigrants uh, seeking asylum here in the US. So. It, are there going to be any consequences for Mike Lee promoting corruption throughout the world like this and working with these nefarious organizations to, to push extreme candidates and, and, and presidents across the world? The fact that it's promoting corruption makes it especially odious. Well, I didn't know anything about that, but I will say that fits with Mike Mike Lee's track record, right? He he supported Roy Moore in Alabama. He raised money at Mar-a-Lago with Donald Trump and Matt Gates and Lauren Boebert. He supports extremist candidates, frankly, all over the country. And as far as corruption is concerned, I mean, this is the same guy who defended Donald Trump when he tried to exhort Vladimir Vladimir Zelensky in Ukraine using US foreign aid. And he fought against sanctions that we tried to impose. We did impose on Russia after it 
its interference in our election in 2016. He voted against those in 2017. And then in 2019, he traveled to Moscow. Moscow a bunch of senators wanted to go to Moscow. Russia denied all of their visas except for Mike Lee's. Mike Lee traveled to Moscow and said that he was going there to talk about religious freedom. But as he was there, the Russians revealed that that they had a conversation about loosening sanctions that the US had had put on Moscow on Putin's regime, the same sanctions that he had opposed. And, and he didn't deny it. And now he's still pushing back against sanctions, even as Russia now begins to slaughter you innocent Ukrainians who are fighting for their freedom. And so, you know, this is this is a track record for Mike Lee. Um, but it's why he's polling at about 40% in Utah. Most Utahns want to replace him. Uh, that's why, you know, we've, you know, got a lot of momentum against him. We've been in the race for about four or five months now. And in our first quarter, we outraised him by 58%. And we did that without taking any money from PACs or special interest groups. Meanwhile, 42 or 43% of his support came from, from those groups. And so we're off to a strong start because Utahns want to make a change. They see that kind of corruption and that kind of extremism and it doesn't represent us. It's not who we are and that's why we're able to build this coalition. Fascinating, Evan McMullen running for Senate in Utah. If you pull off that upset, that would be, that might change the dynamics of American politics. So Evan, thank you for joining us, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, we really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more, there's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR, so those are super fun, but you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video, thank you.